So let's go ahead and get started. Um, like I said, uh, we're not going to use the chat feature much, but thank you for the feedback you guys are giving me. Uh, we're going to use the Q&A, but we'll talk about it in a second. Welcome to Cable No More, brought to you by the Orland Park Public Library. And uh, this is going to be part one, uh, cutting the cord. Everybody can. Uh, everybody can see the presentation there. I hope. All right. My name is Ian Lashbrook. I'm the digital services manager at the Orland Park Public Library. Uh, that's my email address there. If you have any follow up questions, or for some reason we don't answer a question uh, for you this evening, uh, please feel free to to reach out to me uh, at my email address and I'll try to kind of answer any questions I can that way. Uh, one thing that we do want to talk about is the Q&A function like I've already kind of discussed. That's what we want to use to submit questions. I'm going to answer questions at the end of the presentation. There's a chance that I may cover something uh, later on in the presentation. Uh, and you're not necessarily, uh, and you're asking a question about something that'll be covered later. So we'll go through the whole presentation and then I'll go back and look at the Q and A section. Okay. So thank you all for being here. And I hope that we have a, uh, a good informative session and a little entertaining and, uh, yeah, let's go ahead and get started. So tonight for part one of cable, no more, we're going to first start off with a case study. Uh, we're going to talk about a current Comcast customer and what that person kind of came up against regarding price and their internet and cable and all these things together. And then kind of what um, I was able to help them with and kind of change so that they got a much better price while not really uh, getting rid of any of their services. Uh, we're going to talk about um, how your cable bill works, what's included and how much you pay. Uh, what do you really need? Uh, there are a lot of parts to your cable bill, especially if you have, you know, phone, uh, security, cable TV, cable internet, there's a lot there. We're going to talk about those things and hopefully break them down a little bit for you. And then we're going to talk about ISPs and hardware. ISPs are internet service providers. Uh, in the Orland Park area, we only have uh, two options, and that's Comcast and AT&T. Um, we're going to talk about switching to just internet rather than having internet and cable TV. And then we're going to talk a pretty decent amount about hardware uh, tonight. Hardware is one of the ways in which you may see that cable bill go a little bit higher if you're renting equipment and things like that. And I want to let you know about the options that are out there regarding renting uh, versus owning your own equipment. So we'll cover that as well. So when you put it all together at the end, what does this you know, switching from your traditional cable internet package that you're maybe used to, what does it look like when you switch to just internet uh, and then kind of use streaming services, which is what we'll talk more about next week. Um, first, you need an internet service provider and hardware. Most of you probably already have an internet service provider, AT&T or Comcast, like I said. In some cases, um, like uh, for instance, I live in DuPage County and I have WOW internet. Uh, so you need an internet service provider and you need hardware. The ISP provides the service, the hardware translates that service uh, into your home and gives you access to the internet. You need streaming services. Uh, you need to sign up for them. You need to figure out which ones are right for you, which ones maybe aren't right for you. Uh, some cost more than others, some offer more than others. Uh, it really is about catering to your particular viewing needs. And finally, uh, you may or may not need a streaming device. Um, if you have a smart TV, the chances are you can use that TV to access a lot of the streaming services and connect to the internet. But if you don't, you can get a content streamer. Um, some of the big ones that you're familiar with might be uh, Roku is very, very popular. I have a couple of Rokus in my house. Uh, you may have heard about Google has Chromecast. Amazon has a whole line of them like the Fire Stick and things like that. So. Um, if you don't have a smart TV or if your smart TV is older and moves a little slow, you may want to consider investing in a streaming device. Uh, but if you have a newer TV and it's a smart TV, you can always try out some of the things we're going to talk about this week and next week uh, on, on your own uh, smart TV. So let's talk about that current Comcast uh, uh, customer. They were a triple play customer. You've probably heard that. Triple play means internet, cable TV, and phone. Um, 
before uh, this person kind of came to me and said, I'm interested in changing all of this and investigating what it would cost. They were paying $226 a month for these three services. That creeped up to $239 a month over the course of her year-long contract due to changing fees. A lot of times taxes and broadcast fees and things like that can change. Um, the bill would have risen to $271 a month when her contract was up. That's another thing that you'll see ISPs do is they sign you up for a good deal for, uh, for a year and then your fees kind of go up um, by, you know, usually a pretty decent percentage when that year kind of promotional uh, rate is over. The bill also included equipment rentals, which add up over the course of a year. Afterwards, we had this, uh, we had her down to $169 a month with no contracts. She was able to drop services whenever she wanted. And keep in mind that that $169 a month was kind of a Cadillac plan. We're going to break it down here in a minute, but there was a lot to it. She didn't want to lose a lot of her services. She, she was, you know, um, wanted to kind of keep it all and then maybe slowly whittle it away. Also, she owned her own equipment. And the big thing about owning your own equipment is there may be an upfront fee. You have to pay a little bit more upfront, but a lot of times investing in your own equipment will pay for itself within the first year, year and a half uh, of doing that. So it's something to consider. It's, it's an immediate cost, but it tends to, the equipment you buy tends to last um, years and you will save quite a bit rather than paying the monthly rental fees from the ISPs. So let's break down the cost. For hardware, uh, I recommended that she purchase Google Wi-Fi. Google Wi-Fi is a mesh router system with three pods. We're gonna dive into that a little bit more. It is a more expensive system on the market. A lot of people, if they're using an internet router, um, still only use a single uh, you know, routing device for their whole home. Um, the, the mesh routers kind of help spread your signal better across your house, uh, but we're going to talk about that in a little bit. So it's a little bit more expensive, but I will say this. I purchased Google Wi-Fi a couple years ago, and I've set up networks and homes um, and apartments and things like that, and it's always been a bit difficult. Um, this was the easiest setup I ever had to do. It took maybe 10 minutes. Uh, for me to set up my entire house with two different networks, one for every, the people who lived in the house and one for guests. It was very, very simple. The next thing we had to do was invest in a modem. Um, the Google Wi-Fi is not a gateway, which is another term we're going to talk about in a little bit. It requires its own modem. Um, Comcast and AT&T will try to rent you either a gateway or a modem. Um, we'll talk a little bit more about that, but you can buy your own. Uh, a lot of times the modem rental fees, if they're on their own, are like five or six dollars a month. Well, we got her one that will last for several years and it was a hundred dollars. So you figure if it's six dollars a month across, um, that's seventy two dollars across a year. It only takes maybe, what, 15 months for this to pay for itself and it will last three, four, five, maybe six years. The last thing we did was buy a Mohu digital antenna. Um, she was very lucky that where her home in Orland was located, she was able to get a very strong signal from the TV uh, antennas and broadcasts that go out throughout the area. The Mohu digital antenna allows you to pick up a lot of your local channels at no cost to yourself. They're free. They plug right into the back of your TV. You hang them up uh, behind your TV if you're close to a broadcast area. Um, sometimes you have to get it in a window and that can be a little difficult. Um, but in her case, it, it literally sat right behind her TV and she had great uh, great signal strength and was able to get all the local channels for local news broadcasts and sports and things uh, right there on, on her TV without paying for anything. Um, services. She signed up for Comcast internet at 250 megabits per second, which is very good speed. That's kind of the average now. I think a lot of times you'll see ISPs offering 100 megabits per second and 250 megabit per second plans to the average um, kind of homeowner. Um, I am on a 250 megabit per second plan and I am a heavily streaming and internet use house uh, household. So um, she didn't want to sign up for a year long deal. So she uh, signed up for a month to month contract, which is something that these ISPs will let you do, but you have to ask about it. It does cost more because you don't get that promotional, uh, that promotional deal, but you are free to leave at any time and not pay a penalty. 
She signed up for Sling Blue and Orange. Sling TV is an online TV streaming service that offers a lot of your major networks, as well as your kind of second tier cable channels, things like the History Channel, A&E, AMC, that, that kind of stuff, the Food Network, HGTV. She wanted both. She didn't want to lose anything. Like I said, the idea for her was to kind of uh, see everything and then maybe whittle it down over time. She wanted to continue her Netflix subscription and she had already been using Amazon Prime. She just activated the video service. So if you have Amazon Prime and you pay for Amazon Prime, um, one, way, one great way to see if you'd even like streaming content and television and video is to use Amazon Prime Video. If you're paying for Amazon Prime for you know the free delivery and all that stuff through Amazon, you're entitled to Amazon Prime Video as part of that. So that's a great way to kind of test out a service. Um, they have original programming, movies, all kinds of stuff. Uh, what she eliminated was her landline telephone and her cable TV service. Now, the cable TV is an obvious one. The landline is something that everybody kind of needs to think about. Um, I think a lot of times, a lot of folks that I run into are keeping their landline service kind of because that's just something they've always had. A lot of people are uncomfortable getting rid of it, but honestly, if you think about the calls you get on that phone, it's most likely a lot of uh, political ads uh, or spam calls. Uh, I doubt these days it seems like a lot of people don't get the majority of their personal phone calls on their landline. They get them on their cell phone. So eliminating your landline telephone service is a great way to kind of save money and get out of these kind of um, these tough uh, packages that the uh, Comcast um, and AT&T folks maybe have you kind of bundled into. So uh, she went from our current cost breakdown uh, to 169 per month. Uh, afterwards, after a month, a month or two after the switch, I interviewed her and said, how do you feel about it? What was good? What was bad? What's going on? Uh, the first thing uh, in the pros, she it's much more affordable. She's saving at this point over $100 a month um, on her, her television and internet. Uh, the antenna worked great, even in incle inclement weather. This is not always the case. I have to be upfront about this. If you're in a more rural area, if you're a little further out, if you're in a building filled with glass and, and concrete, uh, this can be more difficult. She was very lucky that in her home, the digital antenna worked very well. She really liked the original programming options on Amazon Prime and Netflix. Um, there are just more options now. That was what she was excited about. Uh, not just the typical 8 o'clock to 10 o'clock primetime programming from the major networks. She kind of was able to branch out and find new things. Um, everything is month to month. She can cancel a service if she's tired of it and doesn't want to, you know, do it anymore. Uh, but there were also some drawbacks. There's an adjustment period. Things work very differently. Settings are different. Um, this is different. She was used to using a, a TV and a remote control for a long time. And this, this was very different uh, to her. Uh, she always has to have her cell phone near now because she got rid of her uh, landline. She keeps her cell phone close by. And that's not something she was used to doing. She was used to being able to leave it you know, somewhere else charging or leave it on the kitchen counter and not worry about it. Uh, now she always kept, keeps her kind of cell phone nearby in case of calls and things like that because it's the, her, only, her only phone in the house. Um, she's not sure if sports will all be available and that's gonna be true no matter what. Uh, these streaming services are kind of fighting to get more access to sports and you'll see a lot of the major sports organizations have their own streaming service that gives you access to, uh, to their sports, you know, the major, like Major League Baseball, the NBA, they have their own kind of streaming services to access games. Um, this is kind of comes and goes. Uh, it can be difficult to catch all the sports, especially in the Chicagoland area. But usually, if you have an antenna and you have, uh, you have like Sling TV or a live television streaming option, which, you know, we'll talk a little bit more about next week you can get most sports, if not all, that you're interested in. Just be aware that there's gonna be some gaps and you won't always know what those gaps are when it comes to sports. Um, and when the internet is out, 
everything is out. If the internet isn't working, then your TV isn't working. Uh, that's just, those things go hand in hand. However, if the chances are, if your internet's out, you're probably your power's out and you can't watch TV anyway. So uh, just be aware that if there are fluctuations uh, in your internet connection, that can affect the other things in your home now because everything's running off the internet. Whereas before there may be a fluctuation in the internet, but your TV might stay the same. Um, that's just kind of something that goes with it. The other thing she mentioned that I was not surprised about, but she said kind of kept happening was that she needed to be very vigilant regarding her bill. Comcast kept trying to charge her for things that she no longer had. Uh, she had to call them several times, especially in the beginning to get charges removed from the bill. Uh, if you make the change, be aware of this, this can happen. The ISPs are not always great about updating your account and they may, like, they may leave a charge there you have to be vigilant. You have to look over your bill, especially the first couple months after you make this switch. So how does your cable bill work? Um, the Lightman Research Group uh, at the end of October in 2018, so it's a little bit older now, this survey, survey a little more than a year and a half, uh, states that the average monthly cable satellite TV bill for the American household was currently $107. This is up 50% from 2010. And be aware that that 107 is not including internet. That's just to get cable TV in some way. Um, that's an astounding amount. That's a lot of money. Uh, there are a lot more options now, and, and we've seen a shift in the way a lot of people are accessing uh, television, and we'll talk a little bit more about that. But that's kind of a, a, a shocking statistic, and um, a lot of people are paying too much for, for uh, access to television. I bet some of you feel this way. Um, how much do you pay for cable per month? Um, I made the switch to all uh, streaming. Gosh, it's been a couple years now, but my bill went down dramatically. I think about 50% when I did. I'm paying a little over $100 a month, but I have several streaming platforms that I like, and um, I have a good higher end uh, internet speed. But there's a lot of people out there who are still just paying the bill and paying the same and getting the same service and, and not necessarily paying attention when those rates go up or, or the service charges go up and they kind of feel like they're, they're throwing money away. So I, usually when I do this presentation, I'm in front of a big crowd and I like to have everybody kind of raise their hands and keep them in the air and say, how many people are paying $100 a month for TV and internet? 150, 200, 250, 300 or more. There's inevitably a handful of people paying $250 or $300 or more for their cable internet um, package. Uh, <coughs> I usually come back to a story uh, when I worked in a previous library about a, a patron who came in and said, you know, my my husband and I just had uh, two just had twins a couple months ago, and we haven't really been paying attention to our internet and TV bill. And I looked at the bill the other day, and it was three hundred and fifty dollars. And we watch TV for maybe all of twenty minutes a day. Um, I looked at her and said, "Whoa, that's way too much. You need to bring your bill in. Let me look at it, and we'll try to get you changed around." And sure enough, they had fallen out of contract. The ISP, uh, the service provider was, was, you know, charging them an arm and a leg, essentially, for their services. And all they needed to do was scale back and make some, make some decisions. And, and, you know, it's always tough to make these choices. Change can be hard. And they did and, and were able to knock the bill down to around 150, which, you know, for new parents, that's a lot of money a month that they were saving. So it's really easy to let these bills get away from you, especially if you're signed up for things like auto pay. And a lot of times the service providers offer incentives to sign up for auto pay. So just be aware that, that this can, you know, it can be a difficult thing to monitor and you can lose track of it. And you need to take time to, to kind of look over your bill and reassess and, and find out when is your contract up? When are you able to make changes without a penalty? Maybe you're already in the period where changes won't penalize you. Uh, but a lot of times if you've signed up for a year deal or two year deal, if you try to make a change before the end of that period, you get charged all kinds of penalty fees that kind of erase any of the savings you would have had. So be aware of that, keep an eye on it. It's really easy out of ease of convenience to 
to just go with the kind of standard that you've been going with. There's a lot of other options out there now. So what is in a current cable package? A lot of times, there's your internet. Uh, but along with that comes a lot of additional costs, I think. Uh, there's an additional charge for renting a gateway. Gateways are the new thing that your ISP wants to rent to you. Uh, new, I mean, they've been renting these now, I guess, for almost 10 years. A gateway is a combination of a modem and a router. Um, years ago, when you were setting up a home Wi-Fi network, you would have the coaxial cable would run into a modem and the modem would run a cable out into your router and the routers would actually spread internet throughout your house. Now you have one thing and it's typically called a gateway. Um, there's additional charges for internet security options. I don't know how great I feel about my internet service provider also providing my security. A lot of times if you want internet security, you probably already have it through a company like McAfee or uh, semantic on your computer probably came with something maybe you signed up and pay for a different service uh, getting it from your internet service provider is a little bit of a of an odd thing and then there's additional charges for proprietary extenders and mesh systems and we'll talk a little bit more about that but that Google Wi-Fi mesh system that I talked about in the beginning you can buy a Comcast version of that the thing is it will only ever work for a Comcast internet signal the Google Wi-Fi works with any internet service provider. So be aware of that stuff. It may seem like they're selling you the same thing, but a lot of times those things are proprietary and only work with their service, which again, puts you in a corner and kind of uh, keeps you locked into these things instead of having options. Your TV, there's additional charges for cable boxes. I, well, I've got three TVs in my house, I need three cable boxes. One might be free, but usually they're what? Five, six, seven, ten dollars $10 a box for the other ones that you wanna have around your house. There's also additional charges for HD service. Maybe the first cable box comes with HD service for free, but it's $10 on each additional box. Um, and you're also paying for a lot of channels that you don't even use. This is one of the things I find most fascinating about this, uh, kind of concept in this conversation is <clears throat> your cable TV bill is broken up into all these tiny micro payments out to these, these kind of broadcast networks and these uh, cable channels. We'll talk a little bit about that in a second. But think about it. How many of these do you actually watch? Um, I would guess that you're watching less than 50% of the channels that are available to you. And I bet a lot of people are watching less than 25%. And then there's phone. And again, I know this can be hard for some people. If you have a cell phone, do you really need a landline anymore? If you have a uh, security system tied to your landline, yes, I can see how that may be an issue. But for a lot of people, um, they're hanging onto their landline out of feeling like I've had it for so long, I should have it. If most people have your cell phone number and you get most of your calls on your cell phone, you should consider eliminating your landline phone, if only to eliminate all of the random spam calls you likely get throughout the day. <laughs> um, and then there's security systems, and we're really not gonna get into that, and this is where phone can kind of be different. If you have a phone system tied to a secure, an older security system especially, nowadays a lot of them will run off of smartphones and apps and things, but if you have an older one, then maybe you have to keep your landline, but maybe also you can investigate upgrading that security package to something that allows you to get rid of that landline. This is not an area that we really get into at all. Um, it's kind of its own separate thing, but investigate. Ask your internet service provider or your security company what your options are. So this is probably my favorite bit of information uh, that we'll go over tonight. What are you paying per channel? Now, all the numbers and the things you're gonna see tonight uh, were accurate about six months ago, and they don't get updated very often because some of this information can be very difficult to, to kind of get from the networks and stuff. Uh, and so I just want to let you know that these can kind of fluctuate and change uh, pretty often. So at 20 to 30 cents per month, uh, you're paying for the Food Network, HGTV, Comedy Central, MSNBC, the Cartoon Network. These all come with your kind of decently sized cable package, probably what most people have in their cable package. We go up from there to 40 to 80 cents per month and we have Discovery, AMC, CNN, Nickelodeon. And we go up from there to $1.07, that's the USA Network. And from there we go to $1.55 and that's Fox News. So cable news, Fox News. At 2.09 we have TNT. 
And at $7.86 per month, we have ESPN. This is really interesting. A couple years ago, there was this big shift that started of people switching to streaming television. ESPN lost a lot of money because people stopped paying their cable bills. ESPN is obviously heavily invested in cable packages. Look at the price there. Uh, they made a big scene about firing a lot of their reporters and their sports journalists in an effort to save money because they said that, you know, a, a lot of uh, people were saying that the ESPN bubble had burst because they were so heavily reliant on cable TV subscriptions and people were leaving cable TV. Uh, I would imagine that this model for ESPN has changed uh, over the over the last couple years since so many people are migrating over to streaming services. But it just shows that, uh, you know, there's really one big cable channel in the room when it comes to your cable bill, and that's ESPN. So ISPs and hardware. So ISPs, again, internet service providers. And boy, I bet that picture right there is kind of really accurate for a lot of people. Um, it can be difficult dealing with an ISP. A lot of times they're in charge of both your cable TV and your internet connection, sometimes your phone, and their customer service can be difficult. If you go to a Facebook page for any ISP, it is usually a running list of people complaining that they can't get a hold of them on the phone, that they've, they've, they've been on four different phone calls and their problem still isn't solved. Uh, unfortunately, in the Orland Park area, you generally have only two options, Comcast and AT&T. Uh, these are your two choices. Um, and unfortunately, uh, AT&T doesn't have a lot to offer right now in the area. I believe they're building up their fiber optic network, which may be why they're not offering as much uh, or as many deals as Comcast currently is. Um, but, you know, you have to investigate both and, and look at both. Um, I think a lot of people might be under the false impression that switching to streaming TV means that you don't have to deal with one of these companies anymore. That's not true. We're not cutting the cord entirely. We're getting rid of cable TV. Uh, we're, we're, we're still having to have internet service, and these are your, your vendors for that in your area. Um, so unfortunately, you know, you may still have to communicate with them and have customer service calls with them and things like that, but hopefully it's only for one service instead of a handful of services. So how does your cable internet service actually work? Um, service is delivered to your home by coaxial or fiber cable. In most cases, it's going to be coaxial. Um, there'll be a buried line or a line up um, in, in the uh, telephone poles that's run to your home. Um, previously, uh, I lived in Glen Ellen and all of the, the cable lines on my street were on the telephone poles. Uh, we moved to Naperville and the lines are buried. Uh, so it can be different everywhere, but it's delivered to your home via coaxial. Usually there's a box outside on the outside of your house where the service kind of comes into and originates for your home. The cable signal is split across the house. So the cable signal has to be split for your um, gateway or your uh, modem. And then it has to be split to each TV that you're going to hook up with a cable box if you have that set up. Now, if you're going with a streaming option, you only need one origination point. That would just be for your uh, modem and router or your gateway uh, because your TV then would use either a streaming device or if it's a smart TV, um, it would use Wi-Fi antennas to connect to your signal that way. So right away, you're able to eliminate some of the um, customer service issues that can occur. If you have a home that's heavily wired and has a lot of coaxial running around, this gets rid of that. And each time they split the signal, the signal kind of, you know, gets a little bit weaker. So if you only have one entry point for the service, it can make it a little bit uh, simpler. Wired coaxial cable goes to your cable boxes and to your gateway or your modem. The gateway delivers wireless service throughout the house or a modem runs to the router, which delivers wireless signal throughout your house. This can be confusing. I, that's why I keep harping on it. A gateway is a modem and router together. I in my home have a modem and the coaxial comes into my modem. My modem then has a cable that runs to my Google Wi-Fi router that then spreads the internet throughout my home. A gateway in a lot of times, a lot of times if you rent a gateway, it's a single device 
and the coaxial goes directly into it and it acts as both the modem and the router. So your Wi-Fi originates from that unit, uh, which the coaxial is directly plugged into. A mesh system is like having small routers throughout your house. And we'll talk about that in a little bit. But think of the, the big thing to imagine with mesh systems is that instead of having one unit that's blasting Wi-Fi as hard as it can everywhere through your home, um, you have separate units that send a slightly weaker signal that all connect together to kind of create a better network, better network coverage for you throughout your property and your home. So let's talk about all of that hardware. Uh, a lot of times with hardware and with internet service providers, uh, you have to get something installed. And that installation, it, it comes at a cost. Um, you also have to usually get your first TV box. You have to get additional TV boxes, like we said. If you have um, a couple TVs throughout your home, maybe you have one in the family room, one in the basement, uh, one upstairs. You have to get a box for each one and you're going to need an internet gateway uh, and then with Comcast you want to get XFi Advantage which is their security upgrade for that gateway and then uh, with Comcast they want you to buy XFi Pods which is like a mesh network uh, that works with your gateway to spread your signal more evenly throughout your house. All of these things cost money and they're usually all rentals or upfront fees. With installation you pay anywhere from $20 to $100. Your first TV box is typically free. Now that may be free for the first year that you have a deal or two years, I don't know. You should check the language in your contract. Additional TV boxes are typically $10 each. Your gateway is $13 per month. So again, if you're talking about replacing your gateway, a rental unit with something that you own, you have to imagine the long game here. You're, by buying something, even if it's several hundred dollars, it will only take you a year or two to pay that unit off and that unit will likely last four, five, six, maybe even more years. Uh, my current Google Wi-Fi is three or four years old at this point, I think three, three and a half. And so, I mean, it's already paid for itself almost twice over. Um, and then they wanna charge you this extra $2 a month for Advantage, which is their security stuff. And again, I don't know how I feel about having your ISP also provide your security. The pods for Comcast are $119 for a three pack and they are proprietary. If you ever want to switch internet service providers, these won't work. Um, so you're out that money no matter what. Again, if you purchase your own equipment and you follow the guides on their website. So each of the service providers have a list of equipment, uh, especially router, or I'm sorry, especially modems that works that work with their equipment and their service. Um, you can buy one that works with their stuff and it'll also work with other ISPs if you ever switch. Um, when you buy proprietary items, it only works with that provider. So you're stuck using that provider unless you wanna be out of pocket for the cost of that hardware. The other thing we have to talk about are fees. So on top of your regular bill uh, for service, you have rental, rental, uh, rental costs for some of the hardware, and then you have fees. You have a broadcast TV fee, you have a regional sports fee, you have a DVR fee if you use DVR, you have an HD fee, and let's be honest, most people don't watch television in standard definition anymore, and you have taxes. Um, your broadcast TV fee fluctuates, but it's roughly $8 per month. Your regional sports fee also fluctuates, but it's roughly $6.75 per month. DVR, if you're using it, is usually $10 per month. Uh, that's for all those people that want to record all those programs that they miss, and then they just, those programs just sit there. A lot of people don't manage their DVR, and so they fill it all up until they have to kind of purge a whole bunch of programs. Your HD fee is typically $10 per month, and your taxes can be anything uh, depending on your bill. So right away, um, what we have to talk about is that these streaming services don't fall under any of these fees. Uh, DVR is something you can purchase with a lot of streaming services at an additional cost, usually about $5, or it already comes with the service. And that's something we'll talk more about next week with the individual streaming services. But they deliver their programming in HD already. Um, they are not subject to regional sports fees and broadcast TV fees, and they're not subject to taxes right now. Um, there's talk of taxing Netflix. I don't know if that's gone through yet, but that's kind of the big one that a lot of people want taxed. Um, a lot of these uh, services and your internet 
don't fall under taxation of broadcast, like broadcast taxes. Uh, they fall under a different type of infrastructure. And so they're not subject to a lot of these taxes. So right away between your rental fees and your, um, your broadcast and sports and taxes, you can eliminate 10 to 20% of your bill just on fees. That's, that's automatic. That, that just goes away because you've switched to streaming services. Uh, that may not seem like a lot, but that's, that's a savings that you'll see immediately. Um, from there, you kind of work on tailoring your viewing package to what works best for you. And that's where you see some more savings. But to be able to take that right off the top is, is kind of a big deal. <clears throat> so I want to talk about this phrase. This phrase was said to me by a Comcast customer service representative when I attempted to cancel my TV service and just switch to internet. It took me 45 minutes to get through that phone call. This was said to me three different times. Don't be naive. They are trying to keep you locked in to multi-service contracts. You don't need multiple services. You only need internet if you make this switch. That phone call for me really illustrated the problems that can occur when you're dealing with some of these vendors. Um, it, didn't, it, it didn't start out feeling like a life altering decision, but my goodness, 45 minutes later, it sure did. Uh, it was a lot to get through. And um, this person kept offering me new deals and things like that. And I, I had to keep sticking to it saying, no, I just want internet. I want to downgrade my service. Another interesting thing is that with Comcast, you can upgrade your service online. So if you want to add uh, a premium channel, if you want to uh, increase the speed of your home internet, all that can be done online. But if you want to downgrade, for instance, you say, I'm a triple play customer. I just want to go to internet. You have to call them and you have to speak to them on the phone and work through it because they're gonna to try to keep you. They don't wanna lose your money. They want you to stay paying for their services. You're gonna to have to stick to your guns when you call them. You're going to have to be a little tough and, and let them know, you know, if you're making this switch, I'm just inter interested in internet. And it can be hard on these companies' websites to find just internet fees. A lot of times what you see are bundles for TV and internet, TV, internet, and phone. You have to look really hard to find the, the fees, uh, I'm sorry, the cost of just internet. Uh, one of the things that we will have available, I'm not sure where it will be, it'll likely be with this video, um, probably either on, on YouTube or on our website somewhere. I'll have more information next week's session. We have a link to a cost sheet that tells you, uh, the, the, the costs were as of June 1st, that tell you what it costs to just have internet in the Orland Park area. Um, it also gives you the cost for all the streaming services and things like that. It's a great sheet that we update constantly um, to give you the most accurate representation of kind of what you're going to pay. So those uh, resources will be available probably on our website and also somewhere wherever the recording of this video uh, winds up. So uh, we've talked about it a little bit, but what are these types of internet setups? So I talked about the router and the modem. That was the traditional setup, and it still is the case for a lot of people. That's what I currently have. I have my, uh, my coaxial running into my uh, modem, and my modem has an ethernet cable that runs to my uh, Google Wi-Fi, and my Google Wi-Fi has three pods throughout my house. Um, the first one is wired to the modem, the other two connect wirelessly to the original pod. And so you need a couple of plugs, as you can see there from the illustration, you need a coaxial splitter, uh, coming from the wall if you're going to have TV service. If you're not, like me, you don't. You just use that originating wire. The other thing that you can have is a gateway setup. Um, that's a picture of a gateway there. You may have that similar unit currently in your home. Uh, I know like AT&T I had for a while, had kind of a slim black one that was a Motorola. Um, the gateway takes the two units and combines them into one. Now, the one that is becoming the norm and is becoming really popular is a mesh uh, setup. Um, with mesh, there's an ease of access. There's no separate network. There's nothing. You just have one uh, kind of 
meshed together network that covers your whole home. And I think that illustrates that picture there gives you a good idea. The pods are placed throughout your home. Because of that, they give off a slightly weaker signal than one originating Wi-Fi point, um, which you know is blasting as hard as it can, but may not, if it's in your family room, maybe it doesn't reach all the way upstairs to a bedroom. Uh, maybe it doesn't reach to your basement. You know, it's gotta go through a lot of walls. It's gotta go through glass and concrete and drywall. Uh, the mesh on the other hand is a slightly, you know, less powerful signal but because you have it spread out throughout the home, you get a little bit better coverage. Uh, it's more reliable. Uh, for instance, before this mesh network, I used to go out and I'd mow my yard and I had my phone with me and I'd try to listen to music in my, in my headphones. Well, I would at some point always switch over to my cellular network to listen to music because my Wi-Fi signal wouldn't reach. With my mesh network, I would mow my whole lawn and use just my Wi-Fi signal, which is more stable than my cell signal. It's stronger and faster, and I'm not using any of my cellular data. Um, the mesh network was actually strong enough, and because of where I had placed the pods, that it reached outside and I was able to use it throughout my whole property. Um, it's dynamic routing, so your your devices will connect to the nearest point of access. And that's something that can be really great if you, especially with cell phones, um, if you have like portable, portable gaming devices, tablets, iPads, things like that, wherever you are in the house, they'll connect to the, to the closest point to get the fastest signal. There's more flexibility, like I just said. You know, I think a great example is that, you know, me mowing my lawn, I was able to, to maintain a Wi-Fi signal throughout the whole yard. And they're just better security. They're built, um, they're, the, they're the newer technology. They're built more secure. Um, honestly, this, if you're going to change not only your service, you know, and just go to internet, but you're also looking at changing your, um, your hardware, I would highly recommend uh, a mesh setup. This is where most people are going for their home internet options. The, the kind of, you know, as we get close to the end here, one of the things that I really want to do is tell you is that you can do this. It seems very daunting. It can be very frustrating. Parts of it can be confusing. Absolutely. You can do it. And the library can help you with some of this. Uh, right now, we are offering curbside assistance, or I'm sorry, curbside pickup. And we have uh, Roku's and hotspots. If you have never tried a streaming device before, check out a Roku from us. And, and test it, see if you like it, see if you like using it. Um, you can also use a hotspot with us uh, to maybe test to see where, uh, you know, where the Wi-Fi signal in your house currently isn't reaching and you wanna try like maybe a smart TV that can't connect to your home Wi-Fi right now. Grab one of our hotspots and try that. Uh, we also have some other devices there that are available uh, to check out. Uh, including VHS to DVD converters. Um, we have old uh, uh, gaming consoles, and we also have smart speakers, um, Google Home Minis and Amazon Echo Dots that connect to your Wi-Fi and you know can help with the whole automated home thing that's kind of uh, becoming a bit more of the rage. Um, again, my name is Ian Lashbrook. I'm the Digital Services Manager at the Orland Park Public Library. I haven't seen any questions, but if anyone has questions, we're not doing um, audio questions. So if you have a question, please go ahead and type it into, you know, I guess the chat or the question and answer tab. I'm happy to answer them. I know it can be a little tough with text uh, to try to get your point across. And sometimes, your question can be very specific to your home setup. But if you have a question, please feel free. I'll uh, kind of stay here for a couple of minutes to see if anyone's interested uh, or, or has a question for me. Uh, otherwise, um, if you don't have any questions, thank you so much for watching. I hope you enjoyed the presentation. We'll be back next week to talk more about the actual streaming options that are available to you and what they look like, what they cost and what you get with them. So uh, please join us next Tuesday night at 7 p.m. again to talk about uh, streaming options in the second half of Cable No More. So with that, I'll just hang out for some questions, but otherwise, thank you and have a great evening.